It's such an honor for Rylan and me to be given the opportunity to welcome you to our church on this beautiful Sabbath morning. We would like to warmly welcome you to the last BI day of the 2013-2014 school year, and we are ecstatic that it's at Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church. we we'll worship is a joy. We would like to thank each and every one of you for choosing to come and worship us and support Bermuda Institute today. We could, you could have gone anywhere else, but you chose to worship here with us, and we are eternally grateful. Once again, welcome. welcome. Oh, 
just loud enough. Come on, say it. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Revelation 22, verse 1 to 7. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. 
The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his holy word. Good afternoon, church. Pastor Bushner has spent the last five days at Bermuda Institute ministering to us for our spring week of prayer. He has been teaching us how important it is for us to be ready for Jesus' coming. Dr. Bushner is a graduate of Booktill High School in Akron, Ohio, Oakwood University, Andrews University, and the United Theological Seminary. He has ministered in the Allegheny West Conference and the Southeastern Conference. He has served as a pastor, a youth and family life director, a church growth evangelist, and chaplain for Oakwood University. Dr. Bushner presently pastors at the Mount Calvary Seventh-day Adventist Church in Huntsville, Alabama. Pastor Bushner has traveled the world preaching and sharing the love of Jesus. In his own words, preaching is a privilege to talk about his best friend, Jesus, with others. His travels include South Africa, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Canada, Bermuda, the Virgin Islands, the Caribbean Islands, and coast to coast in the United States. It was at Oakwood University that Dr. Bushner met the love of his life, Miss Joanne King, who he has been married to for 30 years. From this union, they were blessed with three sons, Rupert III, Ronald, and Reginald. He and his wife are also the proud grandparents of three grandsons. Dr. Bushner is a lover of young people. He is passionate about empowering both the young and the old. His desire is to see every soul saved in the kingdom of God. His motto for life says, what you are is God's gift to you, and what you become is your gift to God. What kind of gift do you want to give to God? I want to give God an awesome gift. Amen. So Dr. Bushner, on behalf of Bermuda Institute, thank you for sharing your time and messages from God with us. We wish you all the best as you continue to minister. Yeah. After the special music, the next voice that you will hear is that of Pastor Bushner.
chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. That where I am, there you may be also. I want to speak today on the subject, the promise of his presence. The promise of his presence. Many times in approaching the word of God, it is as though we come to God and we're more concerned about our emotions and our feelings about God than we are about God's feelings and emotions about us. And as we come to this scripture text, we will discover that Jesus is burdened and he's yearning to share with his disciples something that is on his heart. He had just celebrated the Passover with his disciples or the upper room experience, the Last Supper. And now he has moved into the last particular stages of his life. And he recognized soon and very soon that he's going to be crucified for the sins of the world. He is burdened, yet he is still concerned about his people understanding that he loves them with an everlasting love. He has walked with these disciples. He has talked with these disciples. He has eaten with these disciples. He has slept. He has done a lot of things with these disciples. For the last three years, he has been with them and he's experienced some things and their faith has been de demonstrated and their love for him has been questioned and tested. And now, as he begins one more time, this last time, as he begins to speak to them, he shares with them the burden that is on his heart. It's nothing like being able to Look into the heart of God and find an expression of love that he has for his children. And I understand now that God loves us more than we can ever imagine. Sometimes we underestimate this love. Sometimes we think we, have, we, can, we can walk away from this love. Sometimes we think we can live outside of this love. But I want us to understand that this love is infinite. This love is unconditional. And God being the hound of heaven, he will never ever let a sinner go. You literally, in order to be lost, I believe it in my mind, that in order for someone to be lost, you will have to decide, and I believe that it will be be decision and not deception for anybody to end up in hell's fire. I believe you have to struggle and you have to strive to be lost because God loves us so much. When we look into the word of God, young people, we find that there is a God who loves us more than we can ever imagine. And in your tender years right now, the Bible says, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days draw nigh and you have no pleasure in them. It's nothing like knowing that you have been ordained by God and called by God and that there is is a God who loves you with an everlasting love. I like what the Bible when it says God commended his love towards us that when we were still jacking up, messing up, messed up, he loved us with an everlasting love. I'm so glad that God did not wait for us to get right or straighten up or make promises and make good on promises we could not keep. I'm glad he looked beyond our faults and saw our desperate need and right in the nick of time he sent his son to die for sinners like you and me and Jesus now is beginning to conversate and talk with them and he begins by first of all saying let not your heart be troubled obviously and evidently Jesus was looking down through the corridors of time and he saw that trouble would be coming I want you to know today my brothers and sisters you are either in some trouble or you coming out of some trouble or you on your way into some trouble trouble has a way of finding all of us it knows your address it knows your zip code and your phone number it knows where you live and it knows how you live in fact trouble will find all of us sometime in our experience 
And I discovered that it's not what happens to you, but it's how you respond to what happens to you. I found out in life you cannot avoid pain and you cannot avoid heartache. You cannot avoid trouble and pain. Trouble will come, but it's all about knowing how to respond to trouble. Trouble will find you. And when trouble comes, it comes unannounced and uninvited. It comes when you least expect it, when you think everything is all right. Right when you've got it all together, here it comes. And then you say one thing after another. It's always one thing after another. And I've stop by here to tell you everybody that live godly you're going to suffer sometimes there are going to be some trials that will come in your life they will sideswipe you the devil will throw a curve but I'm so glad that if you keep your eyes stayed on Jesus he will keep you in perfect peace he says let not your heart be troubled there's all kind of trouble that will come there will be trouble even in the church I thought I would have got an amen on that Trouble will be in the church. Why? Because the devil is trying to stop even those of us who are trying to live godly. Now, I want you to understand just because you signed up to be a Christian doesn't mean you're not going to have trouble. Trouble is going to come. Sometimes we want to throw in the towel. We want to give up on God all because trouble has come. No, trouble comes only to make you strong. In fact, the pen of inspiration said that this way, trials are given in the school of Christ to purify God's children from the dross of earthliness. It's because God sees something in you in the first place. That's why he allowed trying moments to come. God is trying to purge us. God is trying to process me God is trying to squeeze some stuff out of me because the bottom line is he wants me to be with him and he wants to be with me from Genesis to Revelation that's all God ever wanted is a relationship with his people and I reminded our young people this week that sin makes you run when nobody's chasing you The time Adam and Eve sinned, they have been running from God. Every time man has messed up, we have run and we have hid ourselves from God. But you know the bottom line, the essence of the Bible is about an everlasting father, a loving God chasing after his church, wanting a relationship with her. Because in verse 3 it says that where I am, there you may be also. God ultimately wants us to be with him. He wants a relationship. God wants to walk with us and talk with us. But the word says two cannot walk together unless they agree. And I found out that being a Christian means simply agreeing with God. That's all it means. In other words, when God says something, I agree with him. Yes, Lord, you're right. Even if God says you're a dog, yes, Lord, you're right. And I start barking, rough, rough. You're right, God. Whatever you say I am, I'm that. Because you know me better than I know myself. In other words, two cannot walk together unless they agree. And if God points out something in my life, I've got to acknowledge God. That's my problem. And by your grace and by your blood, please help me overcome why because it's always has been his desire to be with me to walk with me all the way back in exodus he said make me a sanctuary that i might dwell with you in fact god wants to be with us his presence wants to guide us he wants to lead us and this is a promise that you cannot put away he wants to be with me can you imagine? Now think with me, my brothers and sisters, all that you have gone through in your life, your ups and downs, your pains, your trials, your trouble, your tribulation, your distress and your problems. God still wants a relationship with me. He wants to walk with me and talk with me. He wants me to know that I am I belong to him. He says, come now, let's reason together. Let's talk about it. Let me lead you and guide you. From Genesis to Revelation, we find these examples apparent and true. In fact, turn with me to Exodus chapter 14. We find even right here in the word of God, he leading the people of God. And when God leads us, he doesn't always lead us the way we want to go. Sometimes God leads us in strange predicaments. Sometimes God leads us in strange situations. But I'm so glad that if God is leading you, you don't have a problem if you follow. 
Notice with me in Exodus chapter 13, the Bible says it this way. In Exodus 13 verse 17, talking about the promise of this presence. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let my people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines. Although that was near, God said, lest preadventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. There are some things that we are not prepared for, and I'm so glad that God, before he allows any trial or tribulation come in my life, I'm so glad God weighs the trial long before it comes, and he looks at my DNA and my genetic makeup. He looks at my parents and my grandparents. He looks at my background. He looks at my environmental tendencies. He looks at who I hang around with. He looks at my habits, and before a trial ever come into my life, he weighs it. And then every now and then, sometimes he says, not yet, not right now. But I'm glad that God will not tempt me above that which I'm able to stand. But with the temptation, make a way of escape. I'm so glad before trials come in my life, God already have looked down into my character. He's already looked down into my situation. And before trials come, he weighs them. And when he gives them, it's because God wants to show me off and God wants to brag on my life. Don't you know? that according to Job, Job only went through trials because God was bragging about him. And when trials come, it's because God is leading us. God is guiding us. And sometimes when trials come, they will knock us off our feet. But the good news is, it's not how many times you fall down. It's how many times you get up. And when trials come, you just got to dust yourself off and say, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And sometimes you just got to declare, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And like Jacob, I'm going hold on to God until he bless me I don't know why I'm going through what I'm going through I don't know why people are talking about me and it seems like I don't know how I'm going to get out of it but if God is leading you you have nothing to fear and the Bible says in verse 18 but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness and while he was leading them, verse 21 says, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud. He always wanted to be with his people. God always wants to be with his people. God wants to dwell with us. He wants to guide us. And that's why young people, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not unto thy own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge God and he shall direct your steps. See, all I've got to do is let God lead me. And if God is leading me, I have nothing to fear unless I forget how he's led me in the past. He's brought you a mighty long way over trials, over tribulation, over problems, over burdens, because God knows where he wants to take you. One of the things we discovered this week as young people, we discovered that way before we ever existed, God had us on his mind. With purpose, he wanted us. He used us for something that to his glory. In other words, we were created, as we said this past week, for the glory of God. And Israel, Egypt, they were coming out of bondage and God was going to use them. And notice again, the Bible says in verse 22, he took not away the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before his people. In other words, he led them all the time. No matter what you're going through, it's God leading you. And sometimes, my brothers and sisters, when we end up in certain places, we begin to question whether or not God is leading me. We begin to look at our circumstances. We begin to weigh our circumstances in our environment. If God is with me, why am I going through this? If God is with me, why am I going through all this pain and all of these problems? Why is God allowing this to happen? It's because God is taking you somewhere. And whenever God is taking you somewhere, you're going to have to go the rough side of the mountain. And trials are going to come. Problems are going to come. But believe it or not, because God is going before you, he's going to open up doors. Let me tell you, doors will open. Trials going to come. Whatever you're facing right now, if you just keep trusting God, your way will be made out of no way. God going to open up doors. I see that when I read the Bible. For instance, the Bible says, finally, when it gets to verse 13, Moses said unto the people, fear not. 
stand still and see the salvation of God. Every now and then, saints, you might become anxious, but there comes a time when you just got to hold your peace and stand still and watch God work. Sometimes God will show up in order to show out, and sometimes he allows you to have your back against the wall, and when you think that it's almost over, God, like a supernatural hero, he will swoop down in the nick of time and pull you out with the mountains on one side and mountains on the other side and the Red Sea behind them. They thought it was over, but because God was leading them, he opened up the Red Sea. And when the Red Sea opened, the Bible says they went right through the Red Sea. But I want you to understand one of the things that blew my mind was I always asked myself the question, how did the Red Sea really open up? Because I said to myself, there must be an answer. And don't you know, when I turn over there in Psalms, the 114th division, look what God did. When I'm talking about the promise of his presence, God will always make a way out of no way. Be encouraged. No matter what you're going through right now, be encouraged. God is going to open up a door. How do I know that? I find in Psalms 114th division. Notice what it says. When Israel went out of Egypt. Now we just now talked about how God was leading them. God was guiding them. God was in front of them. Now notice what the text says. When Israel went out of Egypt. The house of Jacob from a people of a strange language. Verse 2, Judah was his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. Now remember, when Israel were coming out of Egyptian bondage, God was before them. The pillar was in front of them. Remember that? Now as the pillar was going, it was actually the presence of God. The Bible says back there in Exodus that the angel that was leading them, when the army came, the angel went behind them. Every now and then we need protection and not always direction. And every now and then we need direction and not protection. In other words, God was leading them. It was his presence that went before them. And in verse 3 it says, the sea saw it and fled. Now, now that, that was a good place. Child. Let me go back over that. See, what I'm saying is, is that if God is leading you, notice the text says, the sea saw it. Now, my question is, what did the sea see? See, in other words, it's not about me fighting my battles. Israel in the Old Testament never really had to fight. All they had to do is show up and let God lead them. When the ark led, when the ark went before them, it always went before them. And when God showed up before they ever got there, the blessing was already there. See, the problem with me is I can't make my mind up to trust him. Whenever I get to the place, young people, to put God in my life, he's going to open up doors that no man can shut he's gonna shut doors that no man can open he'll drop bread from the sky he'll make water come out of a rock he'll show up and show out because he's God all by himself if he got to take a little boy's lunch and feed a multitude if he's got to walk on water if he has to unstop deaf ears or open up blind eyes he's Jesus all by himself and when you have God is for you who can be against you and when you let Jesus come into your life life I'm so glad he says behold I stand at the door and knock and if any man opens the door I'll come in and sup with you see one thing about it saints we don't have to fight this fight if young people I let Jesus come into my life and the devil comes and knock on the door I shouldn't try to answer it I shouldn't look out the window. You know how we are when people knock on our door. We look out the curtains or we look out the peak hole. You know it's the devil. Get away from the door. Amen. You know it's the devil because it's a devil knock. You know it the last time you got near the door. I don't know about you, but I got in trouble. And if you ever learn how to let Jesus answer the door, Jesus won't peek out. He won't crack the door or with the chain lock on it. He'll open the door wide and swing it open. And when Jesus opened the door standing there, the devil will look in and say, oops, I've got the wrong address. I'm sorry. I'm messing with the wrong person. If you let Jesus in. The promise of his presence is all he ever wants. The pen of inspiration says if we practice the presence of God, we won't sin. 
if I know Jesus is sitting on the couch with me and I'm about to turn on the TV, it's certain things I'm not going to watch. If I'm driving down the street and Jesus is in the car and there's certain places I don't know about you, I'm not going to go. If I know that I'm on the phone talking, testifying, some people say testifying, some people say gossip, I don't know. But, but, but the fact is, <laughs> if I know Jesus is with me, if I know Jesus is sitting there, there's certain things I'm not going to say. Because you know how we always say, well, I, I, I don't want to be the one spreading it, but I heard somebody told me... And, and, See, if Jesus is with me, then he's going to open up doors. You, you know, the Bible says it in Psalms 14, 114. I'm, I'm blown away because, see, many times I, I wonder, how, that Red Sea, the sea. Can you imagine water saw the presence of God and moved out the way? That's what the text says. Can you imagine? I can't imagine that. The water said, oh, oh here come the king of glory. Let him in. And the water said, you stand on your side. And the other water says, you stand on your side. Because here comes Jesus. And that same H2O that Jesus made in the week of creation, he knew that water said, here come my God. Notice verse 4. Not only did the water recognize the presence of God, but the mountains skip like rams. Lord have mercy. And the little hills like lamb. And then they start to use a little ebonics in verse 5. You see the ebonics? There's nothing new under the sun. Ebonics in verse 5. What aileth thee? In other words, why are you tripping? Why are you acting like this? O thou sea, thou that fleddest, thou Jordan, that thou was driven back. Ye mountains that skip like rams and ye little hills like lambs, tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, which turned the rock into a standing water and the flint into a fountain of water. And in other words, when God shows up, you don't have to worry about anything. Wherever God is, he's going to make a way out of no way. Joseph had God's presence. That's why he had God's favor. And even though he went down to the dungeon, he ended up as a second in charge because he had God's favor. Young people, if I had anything to say to you, crave the favor of God. Beg for the presence of God. Yearn for God to walk with you and talk with you. Invite God into your life. I'm not just talking about Christianity or religion. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus you know him he knows you you walk by faith and he will open up doors can you imagine wouldn't it be nice to be so full of the presence of God that God opens up doors and all you got to do you walk past an ATM and money just start coming out The Bible says, the eyes of all look to thee, and thou giveth them their meat in due season. He satisfied the needs of every living creature, and the fact that you are living says God will meet your needs. See, wherever the presence of God is, he's always going to show up and show out. And in fact, the Bible says that on his way, when he came to the Passover in Luke chapter 12, something else happened. Jesus, he was accused of not showing up on time. You remember in the Bible, in John chapter 12, notice with me, in John chapter 12, John chapter 12, again, the presence of God. Notice what the Bible says, in John chapter 12, Mary and Martha had an issue with Jesus because he didn't show up in time. His presence wasn't there. In fact, the Bible says it this way, in, 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 in John chapter 12, the Bible says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. But see, he did it, but they wondering why didn't he show up on time? It was for a reason. In John chapter 11, you go back to where it happened. Now, a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary. It was the Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet. Therefore, his sister sent unto him saying Lord behold he whom thou lovest is sick have you ever called on the Lord and he didn't show up when you thought he should have showed up you prayed Lord I need you 
God, come through. I need you right now. I don't know if you live long enough. You're going to experience some trouble and you're going to call on God. And I said before that times when you don't call on him because problems are not coming in your life. When trials come, we all learn how to pray. See, when things are going smooth, all we do is do what is called knee swipe prayers. We ain't got time to get before the Lord. This is knee swipe prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And keep on going. But when trouble comes, you're going to learn how to hold on to the horns of the altar. You're going to get on your knees. You're going to prostrate yourself on the ground. And you're going to say, Lord Jesus, I need you right now. Your prayer will not be eloquent. All it might be is help. See, that's the kind of prayer. In other words, you don't have to be all eloquent in big words. All you've got to do is call on the Lord. But there are times when you call on him, it seems like he doesn't come through. Notice in verse 4, when Jesus heard that the sickness is not unto death, but the glory of God, the Son of God, might be glorified thereby. Now, Jesus loved Martha and his sister Mary. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place. He didn't move. However, then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go to Judea. And when Jesus went there, the Bible says when he got there, but if any man walk in the night, he begins to talk to him. In verse 11, these things said he after that, he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go and wake him out of his sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. How be it Jesus spoke of his death. But that they who he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. In other words, Lazarus could have never died if Jesus had showed up. Death could have never showed up. Jesus stayed away because he wanted to teach them a lesson about the power of his presence. Notice the text. Notice the text. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But watch this. The Bible says, and I am glad. I'm happy. I'm rejoicing for your sake that I was not there to the intent you might believe. Nevertheless, let's go because I'm going to show you something. The Bible says now in verse 17, then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now, Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs, and many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. But then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, the text says he she went out to meet him. But Mary sat still at the house. In other words, Martha said, I can't take it. You can sit right here, and I know you Christian, and I know you converted, but I'm going to go out here and meet Jesus. And the text says she went out and met him. I want you to know, my brothers, if your wife comes out to meet you, you, you're on your way home. And before you even get in the driveway, she comes out to meet you, you know something going down. The text says, Martha said, now you can sit right here, Mary. I'm going to go out and tell Jesus something. And I believe she had her hands on her hip and she said, Jesus, if you had been here, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but if you had showed up on time, if your presence had been here, I know who you are and I know whose you are. You're God all by yourself. I know that. And if you had been here, my brother would have never died. Oh, yeah, she had an attitude. See, see, Mary was used to sitting at the feet of Jesus, but Martha wasn't all that converted, y'all. So Martha said, I'm going to tell him. And she got all up in Jesus' face. She said, if you had been here, he would have never died. And Jesus says, chill out, homegirl. Hold on, hold on. I've got something for you. Now, watch what the text says, my brothers. Watch what the text says. The power of his presence. And I'm, by the way, I'm almost finished. The power of his presence is incredible. Wherever God is, he always going to do something miraculous. If I can just invite God into my house, if I can just invite God into my marriage, if I can just invite God into my future, if young people, if I can just invite God into my life and give God an opportunity to do for me what I cannot do for myself, God always going to work it out, make it work out because he's God all by himself. We discovered that he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's immutable, he's sovereign, he's Lord all by himself. 
He's Adonai. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Sikhanu. He's Jehovah Raphael. He's my healer. He's my lawyer. He's my rock. He's my shield. He's my everything I ever need. And so whenever I'm placed in a situation, my God is going to show up and show out. I've just got to stand still, get out the way and say, God, have your way. And when God shows up, something going to happen. Notice what the text says. We're talking about the second coming. He is coming again. But right here, my young people, notice it says in verse 21, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you ask of God, he will give it to you. I know that. Jesus said unto her, thy brother. Now watch this, my brothers and sisters. This is a powerful point here. Because one day, Christ is going to come back. Evidently, when he says here, Jesus saith unto her now if Jesus believed that when you died you went to heaven why does he say in verse 23 your brother shall rise again if when you die you go straight to heaven why is Jesus in your Bible it's probably in red letters Jesus says to Martha your brother is going to rise again Now, why are you tripping? He going to rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that. Even Martha had been to Sabbath school. Even Martha had been to adventures. Even Martha was a pathfinder. She said, I know the doctrines. I believe that he's going to rise again. But my heart is broken right now. I wish I had him here right now. I miss my brother. And notice what she says. Martha said, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, now these are some very powerful words right here. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection. Now that's important. That's important right there. And I'm about finished. I'm about finished. I am the resurrection. In other words, Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. But that where I am, there you may be also. However, if you die in the Lord, you have nothing to worry about because he says, I am the resurrection. Now, notice what he does say. I am the resurrection. He doesn't say, I'm going to perform the resurrection. Now, get this. He doesn't say, I'm going to make the resurrection happen. He doesn't say that I'm going to wave my hand and when I come back, I'm going to say, no. He says, I am the resurrection. So no matter who you are, whether you are dead or alive, the Bible says it this way. Jesus is coming back. I, w- I didn't want to remind us of all the signs and the time and how bad it is and all the shootings and killings and all the muggings. And I didn't want to remind us of all the signs of wars and rumors of wars. We know we can look at the handwriting on the wall and tell that very soon Jesus is going to mount up on a white horse and he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. And when he comes back he's not coming back as a baby in a manger he's not coming back with grace but he's coming back with glory and the bible says when he comes back every eye shall see him and even those who pierced him and i want to be able to say along with all of us lo this is my god who i've waited for and he shall save us right on king jesus and when he comes back i want to hear him say well done thy good and faithful servant but the truth of the matter is some of us might fall to sleep in death but even death is not the problem because when we die in the Lord the Bible says the dead in Christ gonna rise up first and we which remain gonna be caught up to meet them in the air that's good news saints Jesus is coming soon and when he comes back he's coming to get his children and I'm so glad that when he comes back he's gonna be he's not gonna be the resurrection he says I am the resurrection It's like this, saints. We could be walking around doing our own thing right now. The clouds open up like a scroll and we see something coming back about the size of a man's fist. All of a sudden it gets closer and closer and none of the newscasters can tell us what it is. But all they know is something spectacular. And the closer it gets, earthquakes start popping off. Even the earth begins to recognize here comes God. And the earth begins to reel and rock. Lightning begins to flash and thunder begins to thunder. And all of a sudden such such a... 
all of a, all of a, all of a sudden, nature itself begins to turn on itself. But we who remain, when we look up, we're going to be able to say, come on, Jesus. I knew he was coming. He promised. He said, if I go away, I'll come again. Here he comes. We've been waiting on him. We've been praying for him. We've been hoping for him. We've gone through some hardship. We've been in hell, gone through hell, but praise God, he's going to deliver us from hell. He's coming back, brothers and sisters, whether we like it or not. And the good news is this. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Well, what does that mean, preacher? I'm closing. You can play some closing music. See, one thing about it, in this life, there's no guarantee. We experience heartache, problems, trials, difficulty, and we wonder why. One of the things we discussed with the young people was that somebody asked the question, if God is so powerful, why did he allow this to happen in the first place? If he's omniscient, all-knowing, why did he allow us to go through this? I explained to them that God doesn't move through time linear. He has everything in front of him as though it's happening right now. He knows about yesterday, today, and tomorrow Next year, next week, he knows your thoughts. He knows everything. He's omniscient. And we discussed that being that he's omniscient, knowing that he was going to make Lucifer, and Lucifer was going to make a bad decision and become a devil, and then come down and tempt Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve would sin, and then we would all be in sin. Some of us would experience some heartache. Some of us would experience some pain and go through some ups and downs, cancer, disease, sickness. This hurts the heart of God. God is paying to see us going through this. He never, ever wanted us to experience the pain that we experience in this life. The heartache, the break, the losing of a loved one, the death of a friend, a mother or a father. This was never God's intentions for us. However, you say, well, why did God allow it? It's because God didn't want robots. He didn't want people serving him because they had to. In a moral order, he had to give the power of choice. No one can develop without it. The only way I can grow, I've got to be given the power of choice. And see, the problem is with love, love can't demand your love. Love can only say, I, I choose me, but it has to be with no strings attached. And so God was in a dilemma because he, even though sin exists, he wanted you and me to be able to experience him on our own volition. He knew that there would be some people that would want to come back and it would be their choice to want to be saved. So I'm going to make a way out of no way. Even though the first Adam messed up, I'll send the second Adam. And in the second Adam, anybody who's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. That's why now, even if you die, that's not your worst problem. Because death is only asleep. It's like blinking your eyes. And when you open them back up, he that shall come, will come. And he's coming back. You can be living right now. And if you die, time goes by just like that. They even asked me the question. If we die, do we have time to get it right? No. Once you die. See, I told the young people this week, I said, once you close your eyes in death, you, you are sealed in the way you go down, the way you coming up. So that's why we got to make our calling and election sure. Why I've got breath in my body right now while I'm moving and have my being while I'm living. I've got to make a decision for the Lord right now before time runs out. Because, see, when I go down in death, this is how fast death is. And that's too slow. Let me, let me show the people over here. Let me show. That's how fast death is. See, the truth of the matter, death is like this, young people. Blink your eyes. Open them back up. You're facing now your God. The question that I have to ask myself is, what was worth losing my soul for on this side of my blink? When I blink them, open them back up now, I've got to see the Lord. The question is this. Well, what if God didn't exist? They asked that question. I said, well, I'd rather live as though he does exist and find out later he doesn't. Than to live as though he doesn't exist and find out later he does. Because I can't undo what I did when, I, when you, know, you live and you die. You say, oh, I didn't know God exists. Yeah, I do. Oh, oh too late. 
It's like blinking your eyes. The Bible says it this way, and I'm closing. The living know that they shall die, but the dead don't know anything. Paul says in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this mortal must put on immortality. In other words, if I'm in Christ, when Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection, this is what he was saying. If you in me, you have nothing to worry about. That's bottom line. Outside of me, you got problems. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That's the reason why I, I compare it to a, 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 a boarding pass. A boarding pass allows me to know where I need to show up at the airport. It allows me to know what gate. It allows me to know what time they're going to board. It lets me know the zone, the seat. It gives me all that information. Don't you know this is our boarding pass, the Bible. It tells us what to do, where to show up, what gate to attend. And when we do that, guess what? When I find myself at the gate, when I get there, I go and get in the plane. I sit down, put my seatbelt on. All of a sudden, the plane takes off. I'm flying, but I'm not flying. I'm flying, but I'm not flying. And what I mean by that is all I did was place myself in an environment or in an apparatus that could do for me what I couldn't do for myself. I couldn't fly, but because I had enough sense to follow the instructions, I got in the plane and the plane took off and now I'm flying. I want you to understand that Christ says, I am the resurrection. I am the 777. And if any man be in me, he's a new creation. And when I take off, when I get up, when I come back, everybody in Christ. Christ is going to take up. God is in control. God is in control. And his presence, he wants to be with me right now.